Let's give a lot of juice, a lot of energy to our first contestant from Kairos Watches, all the way from Korea, Sam Yang, everybody. Thank you. Take it away, Good Sam. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm very excited and honored to be here at this stage. I'm here to introduce Kairos Mechanical Smart Watch Hybrid. So here we go. So we have, everyone has different style. Um, maybe you guys can match who, what style that you're more fitted with. They all wear different type of watches. But what are these watches for? What kind of statement are you making when you're make, watch, wearing these kind of watches? In terms of numbers, I want to talk about 1.2 billion units are sold annually. These are regular watches. 29 million of them are smart watches. Uh, sorry, Swiss made watches. 77% of them are mechanical. In terms of numbers, again, that's 924 million units. So in order for a regular wristwatch to be successful, you need three main things. Design appeal, brand appeal, and monitor value. Design, you know, I guess pictures say, say more than words. Uh, brand, uh, when you're wearing a bright, Breitling, what image are you making? You're successful, you're into aviation. How about Samsung? Well, known for TVs, mass production. Kairos, we're all about early adopter who's also into style. And monetary value. Um, when, when men wear wristwatches, it's also about how much it's worth. And obviously, with an all-electronic component, like most of the smartwatches out there right now, you can't re increase the value of the price because, it's, again, it's all electronic. With Kairos, we have mechanical movement inside, so we can actually increase the value. Roll the video. This is a short video clip. The main technology comes from this transparent organic LED display system that's going to go on top of the face and underneath the crystal sapphire protection glass. So it does most of the, all, all the uh, push alerts, emails, text messages, remote control features, camera, music player, again email, has advanced uh, watch features as well. Okay. Okay, stop the video please. Okay. So in order to protect this, we've already filed patents in the US and EU. Uh, filing date goes back to February. It, it, the patent covers the actual assembly of the unit, comprising of transparent display, PCB, mechanical movement, including quartz into one unit. It also includes projection, mini projectors. Here's an example of an off stage and on stage for the display. Uh, that picture was actually taken yesterday in front of Starbucks across the street. That's a, uh, this is a, a visual uh, prototype that we have here. Firmware, we're going to be using our own SDK as well as we're going to have room for Android Wear once they come out. It's also going to be compatible with iOS. Mechanical specs, 46, it's, it's a pretty sizable watch. Uh, for Kairos, it was actually beyond tech. It was more, uh, there's a big challenge with, in terms of putting it all together in a mechanical body. And we had to come up with a very unique way of doing that. It all came together. Now, we're going to be doing a pre-order round two. And the price point, the, with the cheapest one is going to be MSRP $1,100, but for the next two months, we're only going to do, uh, sell for $499. It goes all the way up to $3,000, and that's because of the Swiss movement that goes inside. So we have our team here. There's me. I've done, uh, I'm an early dot-com veteran from 96. I was actually 17 years old back then. I kept on doing startups ever since then. I have a hardware background as well as a fashion background. Um, and also, Ken is the uh, uh, formal um, corporate uh, finance VP at Renault. We have our CTO, he's a Samsung and LG guy. Uh, our software guy is Gabriel Gonzalez. He's, he's done a lot of embedded software technologies for uh, Spain military and whatnot. We have a designer. We have a biomedical expert, Ryan. Our exit strategy is really, um, it's not really to sell to Google or you know, Apple and whatnot. We're targeting the Swiss watch groups. So um, Richmond, LVMH, Swatch, 
Uh, 1% market penetration from smartwatches, it's actually, it comes out to $214 million of, uh, um, I guess, net loss for them. So we're targeting to build our technology, build our brand. Also, we're going to do um, OEM supply to these uh, brands and then hopefully uh, exit at a very sizable price. That's what Star is all about, right? <laughs> so there you go. You can find us on Techlist and on our website, carswatches.com. Um, just in case you guys want to take a look at, closer look at the watch and pass it around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the... <laughs> no, it's not, yeah, it's not, yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, AKA Hawk watch. <laughs> No, we're actually going to be doing our own website, our okay. own pre-order. So uh, you have not gone on uh, Indiegogo? We've actually tried uh, Kickstarter on a different product just to t test it out. But we've, we feel that we'll have an enough buzz with our product and we're going to have a different uh, marketing strategy. Is your design do. limited by the size? You know, because you, you have to put in all, all the, the uh, firmware and the software to do that, the, to do the smart uh, watch. Yes. So is this only for men? That's my earlier <laughs> question. Yeah. Well, yes, we're going to start with the, the men's watch, um, but we will eventually have uh, a woman's watch. It's going to be 38 millimeters in diameter. It's still going to be a little bit sizable, though. It won't be very thin or small. And what should the defensibility with like, you know, for just all the other kind of watch companies that would come into this space? Because I mean, I know it's patented pending, but it's okay. pending. Because the moment yes, I think that you start to, you know, do any sales, right? Like you don't have the distribution, right? That these big companies do, whether it's offline even, or even like, let's just say online. Well, that's interesting because I've actually went to Basel World in March. And the traditional retail chain, the watch retailers, are very concerned about the entrance of smartwatches eating away in their shares. So when we introduced Akaros to some of these uh, personal introductions that we got, distributors, they were very excited because now they finally have a product that they can compete with Samsung, Apple, and Pebble and whatnot. So we're not going to be selling our product on Best Buy or things like that. We're going to be distributing our product through the traditional channels. Um, you, you made a quick note earlier about uh, OEM for some of the other brands. Like, that got me quite excited. It's, it's, it's kind of like your Kairos technology as a platform. Could you expand on that a bit? Is that a big part of your strategy? Is this a yes. small thing? Yes. Uh, it's sort of like a carrot stick idea where we're going to, you know, a lot of the Swiss watch companies, they're not technical companies and they don't do startups, right? They don't fund startups as well, most of them. Um, so they know about us, right? And once we are more established and our, all of our uh, prototypes are done, we're going to start supplying them with our components. And so, for example, imagine Omega smartwatch powered by Kairos, for example, right? Yeah, it's kind of like yeah. Intel inside. Because I think, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that idea, I don't know, that yeah. idea fascinates me a little bit yeah. more than selling the actual watch itself, you know, having the Intel inside thing. I don't know, just, just musing. So, Sam, why are you here? Why am I here? <laughs> to meet everyone, um, also to raise uh, funding. And how much is that? Uh, one million. Uh, may I know uh, more detail on your fundraising? Uh, how are you going to spend that one million? Is it more how than are, Okay. Yeah. Well, in order to, as you can see, our transparent display is square. In order to make that into a circular format, uh, it's going to cost around $130,000 USD. And then uh, the PCB board, I mean, we're working on the schematics, but we have to actually make the prototyping of that. The watch, comp the metal components, the, the molding, all of that, it, it comes out to about three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. And then the rest is marketing and operations. Um, how much research work you know, have, you, have you done? Because you are crossing between the tech, yes. you know, the techies, the gadget, the geeks, versus you know, a bunch of people, people who like, people why they buy hundred, you know, thousand dollars worth of watches. It's because of the mechanism of, you know, of the watch, right? right. And uh, those are different categories of people, and they may not necessarily be the techies. 
you know okay. so yeah. so how much work have you done to to find out you know to to what segment because of course it's a very large addressable market mm -hmm. from for the watch you know time pieces but it's, we are talking about a different class okay. so could you share with us what have you done to find out you know this I'm group I'm very happy targeting? that you mentioned this uh, you asked this question because uh, our target market is the, in the 30s and 40s okay people have more disposable income they're my age group right we grew up with desktops we didn't grow up with smartphones we didn't grow up with you know std uh, uh, laptops. Our design actually uh, is a reminiscent of a desktop. You know, the, the, the second hand is the fan blade of the desktop, you know, the fans and the, the cover. So our target is the, I guess, the, the more mature and older pebble buyers, if I may say. <laughs> right? So it, we're really targeting a different group altogether. So the early techies who are older, who can proudly wear a mechanical watch but also have smartwatch functions, that is our target. Great. Thank you very much, Sam from Kairos Watches. Good evening. Is there something you want to learn, but you keep putting it off? Study Pact is for you. What is the big problem with studying? It's motivation. How to keep on track with your study goals over a long period of time? Did you know that online course systems like Coursera have only a 5% completion rate? At Study Pact, we help our users to an astonishing 85% completion rate for their own weekly study goals. And for those of you who already have the motivation, I have something for you as well. Let me show you Study Pact. Study Pact works on your computer and on your phone. This is my phone, and it's full of distractions trying to stop me from studying. Imagine if you could go one year back in time and exchange only half of the time that you spent watching TV, playing games, reading tech in Asia, and instead use it for studying. By now, you could be well on your way to fluency in another language. Enter Study Pact. One of my f favorite holiday spots is Spain, but my Spanish is terrible. So I'm going to sign up for a pact on study pact for three hours of studying Spanish every week. And I'm going to put up $50 to make me keep my pact. But what is risk without reward? That is where you come in. Everyone that makes his pact on study pact is going to get paid by study pact. Sorry for the slides. Here. So that's right. The money I lose when I don't study goes to you. This is our main screen, and it shows me I have three hours left to go this week. For my Spanish lessons, I'm going to use Duolingo, which is, by the way, an excellent language learning app. Take note that in the top left corner, it is tracking my study progress. Let's see how far we got. Oh yes, two minutes closer to fluency in Spanish. Hasta la vista. We have released the beta on the Android Play Store, and we're seeing early and nice feedback from our users. We have integrated with the top 20 most used study apps, and we're adding more as our users request them. This beta was released one month ago, and we're seeing nice and steady growth. On average, we're making a revenue of $1.50 per user per week. This includes the users that are successful, which never get charged. To date, that is $350. And take note that our cut and commission is 50% of that. The other 50% get paid back to our successful users. With a success rate of 85%, we are the missing link to make e-learning work. So who are we? I'm very lucky to be able to work with two highly successful people. We have Paul, our marketing and design genius. He has a half-finished PhD in UI design. And he's a member of the ME310 teaching team at Stanford University. We have Evan, our mobile app developer. 
If it fits in your pocket, he can make an app for it. Actually, just recently, one of his free apps reached the number one download spot at the Japanese iTunes store. And lastly, we have myself. I'm the big data expert with a passion for behavioral design. I've been programming since I'm 10 years old. Together, we are study packed. Originally, we met in Kyoto, and we're now part of the Open Network Lab Accelerator and live and work together in Tokyo. This is our market, the edutech market. It is predicted to double until 2017. So how do we take our three-person startup to world domination? Let me tell you. StudyPact is not only a great app, but also a platform. A platform that measures and analyzes your study habits across all study apps. And we will use this data to find new and better ways to motivate you to study. I believe in 10 years time, studying will be just as fun and entertaining as mainstream games like Candy Crush is today. Now put your money on Study Pact. You can find us at booth number one or on Tech List. Thank you. Your target uh, users? What Our target age group users. And what kind of courses are you looking at? Our target users are users that are trying to form long lasting study habits. So we're still talking to our current user base to figure out what is it exactly. My, in my opinion, we're still small. So, in my opinion, we are mostly targeting users that are like, um, they have the motivation, like I think everybody in here, to get started. But the hard part is to stick to something. Um, it's probably on the specific question, younger people in their, like, who use technology for their studies. I don't have a better answer yet. Um, I just want to clarify that I understand this. Your business model is really based on laziness, right? I mean, if you have really hardworking people, you're not going to make any money. Is that right? Um, well, if you say it in a yes or no question of like, there is no lazy people, then that is true. But this is a continu is continuous, right? So the more successful we get in motivating people, the more attractive our solution becomes. And the more people we will get. Because there is a big mismatch between what content providers are currently being able to like, attract in terms of um, retention and what, what we can give them. So if we would reach 100%, then there is a lot of business development opportunities where we can reach out to, let's say, Coursera or other providers like that. So you make uh, your users currently, you're saying they make uh, $1.50 for you every week. Correct. Right? And um, how long do they last before they stop? Um, do you have any data on that? Um, because we launched only one month ago, that data is very unreliable. Okay. On the retention. So, yeah, that makes sense. So let's say you, let's just say for discussion's sake, like they stay with you for eight weeks, right? And it makes you eight times, uh, so you make six, well, you save $12. $12. So for customer acquisition, what are your thoughts on acquiring customers for less than $12 a user? Um, so far, we're focusing on a viral model. Like we have not spent any money on marketing. The only thing we have done is uh, post on Reddit, which is a marketing channel but we're planning to integrate viral features that they can get motivated on the social side with having their friends compete with them and we're trying to build that into like the core growth engine. So the current amount of users, they cannot invite their friends yet? Not yet. Hmm. Well, I, I mean, just, just a bit of point of feedback. It's, I think it's useful to figure out what kind of partnerships you can make with your course partners so you can acquire users for free from, of them, you know? So they can, well, I'm signing up for Udemy already. From Udemy, I use Study Pack. Because otherwise, if you're going to rely on paid acquisition, you're going to need a lot of money to do that. Oh, thank you. How, how long have you been at this? How long have you been doing this? Is it Study Pack? Yeah. Um, I found the idea about one year ago. And I got started building a prototype straight away, which took me only three weeks. The hard part was figuring out the paperwork to get a payment processor. We then launched a proto it still was me launching this prototype, which was only integrated with one study application and got us our first users that were willing to put up their credit card data. 
And from there, we joined the Open Network Lab Accelerator in January. And I got my team on board who joined me in January. And we launched this Android application one month ago. Okay, so um, you try to optimize the way people uh, learn through mobile education app, right? So are you depend on the size of the market of this mobile education? And do you know what kind of size is that? Do we depend on the mobile market? Um, mobile education. Yeah, we are planning to raise a, f a run route na right now, and we want to use that to expand upon, like, further from the Android to iPhone and as well desktop and browser. So that will be not the limiting factor. So our goal is to be able to allow you to use any like app or platform for your studies that you want. It's quite convoluted to me, you know, because first you, I think you will try if people are less motivated to study and then, you know, you make money because they are lazy like what Bing Sin say. But yet, on the other hand, you know, people who want to go and study, they must be motivated, you know, to do that study. So one comment I, 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 or suggestion is that, uh, you know, I think the parents will be very interested in wanting their kids to study and the parents will be happy to, you know, deduct from the child's you know, pocket money if they don't study. But the only way to do that, you know, they could use your, yeah, you can use your app, you know, to help them, you know, fulfill that. So you might want to consider, you know, uh, having a third party to come in, you know, to provide that motivation factor. Thank you. We have gotten that feedback before and um, so far, because I can relate to that better, we're focusing on people that have the motivation themselves to get started, but know that they get distracted on time. As a, as a reference, I live in Japan, and I like to also study Japanese. And um, I know a lot of people who want to study more Japanese. So what they do, their current solution is signing up for a Japanese language school where they go on the weekends. And they tell me they don't need the teacher, they don't need the content, it's all available for free. And they can do it themselves, they're not stupid. But they know if, they, if there is no feedback, if there's nothing coming, then over time they will stop. And that's why they do it. And they spend money on the school just because of that. And we can give them a solution that gives them the feedback. Excellent. Thank you very much, Toby. Thank you. It's Toby from Study Pact, everybody. My name is Nick. I'm the CEO of Postparty. Thanks for being here. Postparty is a social network and marketing platform for the real estate. We connect the real estate professional with their team, partners, and clients, and empower them with the network and marketing platform that help them to close property deals more effectively. The real estate is, industry is falling behind in terms of technology innovations and have been stagnant in the web 1.0 for many years. But real estate professionals and consumers continue, rely, continue to rely on this broken technology, transaction million dollars of worth of property deals and serving the millions of clients. I leave this the first time I was worked as property agent with TDZ, one of the top agencies in the world. And there's a lot of frustration in using the current systems. It, there's no easy way for us to stay connected with our teams and partners, and we have a hard time getting to know what are the listings available from our partners. It's effective that each of the tools that we use is not integrated, and it's very ineffective for us to run our marketing and SMS campaign. But over the years in the real estate industry, I clearly understand what the real estate industry of tomorrow looks like, where the success of individual agents and agencies depends on the team as well as the network and the ability to outreach their listings within the shortest period of time using the marketing apps. And that's basically what we do, and that's what we believe in. Let me just quickly show you how it works. We make it so easy to post and share your property listings. Real estate professionals can post the listings on the mobile and on the web, and all their team members and partners will receive a notification right on their phone. And the agent have these options to cross post to these listings to Property Guru, ST Property, and iProperty easily on the go with the auto post app. It is a tedious process for agent to post their listings this way, and this is basically how we build our business. We are currently in the beta, and we have some users tractions, and we are glad to share with you that we have about 10% of market share, as well as have 137,000 property listings crossing so far. And we secure our strategy partner with SAEA, one of the um, real estate industry body that helps us to network with the real estate agencies and bring them, and we are discussing with them to bring them on board. But aside from building the real estate network among our users, we strongly believe that there should be something more to empower the estate agents in serving their clients. 
and we, we do something completely innovative by introducing the marketing app platform within the real estate industry. Let me show you, uh, previously we have shown you the um, team and the Autopos app in the previous demo where real estate agents can do the marketing through the channel. We also have this target agents app that the agents can do district targets um, advertising. And I can simply compile an email newsletter within, and within five minutes, all my team members or even my client will receive on the equation by simply drag and drop the property photos or even drag and drop their property listings if, and you're ready to go. Of course, I can also send my SMS campaign to my client and get the project information to them within a minute. We're making sure each of the, every of the agents have the competitive advantages to compete in this market and serving their clients. And that's basically how we build our business. We have a very solid business model whereby real estate agent pay us to use our app, build their team, auto-post their listings, running the email or marketing campaign. Our app's price range from $100 to $300 per app. And we are going to share with you, we have about 5% paying customers for now, and each of our customers is paying $300 per customers. We are looking to achieve this uh, more than 30% conversions and double our revenue per customer in the future. But how are we going to do it? We have this mob, each of the apps go on mobile, and this will enable us to serve the agents who are always on the go. And it's a breakthrough and significant milestone for us, and we expect to increase our revenue source, short, um, revenue source in the future. Real estate property sales and investment have been clocking over 30 billion a year for the past three years. And real estate professionals are really accustomed to paying for real estate advertising and marketing services. And to give you a ballpark figures, on average, your agents spend 10 to 20% of their income on advertising. From few hundred to few thousand dollars a month, and amount to 200 million spends on advertising a year. And we expect them to continue to use our app to run their marketing campaign and serving their clients. And we're looking forward to expand into regional as well. Our team have been working together for a year and strongly believe in building teams to disrupt the real estate industry. We have two former engineers from IBM, William and Hafiz, who is taking charge of the product and design as well as assistant architect. And I've been in the real estate industry for two, three, four years before starting the company. A very strong technical and business team. The world doesn't need another property portals. What we need is a platform that provides us the limitless potential to empower the real estate industry with technology and a process that make property purchase or renting easier than before for the whole real estate industry. We hope you are excited about us as possibly, and we are looking forward to connect with you later. Thank you. Can you uh, just walk me through your sales cycle, your sales process? Um, for, for now, we are still in the beta launch, so we are m mainly going through uh, referral cases, where we, that's how we get the 3,000 over 400 um, um, uh, members on board. And uh, we also have the um, team leaders who is actually very keen to bring the, these solutions to the team members. And the cases where the like, SEA partnerships, uh, that's how we, how we get all the um, um, uh, users. There are about 9,000 real estate agents in Singapore. Oh, there are about 35,000 real estate agents in Singapore. Oh, 35. Okay, yes. good. <laughs> so how, how much do you think you, you can get from each one of them per, per, per year? And then um, right now, on average, our paying customer pay about $300 per customer. But we are looking to achieve average from $700 to $1,000 a year. Because this platform allows you to build a lot more, more apps along and the and way. And what percentage of the market do you think you can get? Uh, we are targeting at least 10 to 20,000 of the users of, from the real estate industry. That's at least 50% of the 35,000 agents. Okay. You think that's realistic? I think so. Okay, for now, we, our strategy on the mobile is pretty strong. And that's where ST Property or iProperty does not even have a mobile app that allows the agents to post their property on the mobile. And we have this auto post app which allows them to cross post their listing to Property Guru, iProperty, and ST Property with a simple click of a button. And we have very high demands in terms of this auto post app. What we are looking to launch this coming month is to launch our mobile, mobile app, and it, it should be a realistic expectation. Um, did you track end-to-end uh, -end from the property agent all the way to the closing of the sale? Okay, um, we do think of how we can harness the consumer's market, whereby we want the consumers, such as people like you guys here, that come and connect with the agents as well, which will allow the consumers to evaluate whether the agents are, are a good agent or whether these agents are professionals. So this is the angles that we are looking into. But for that to happen, we need to have a, list, a strong fundamentals as to start from. So 
your target market is mainly Singapore? Well, for these solutions to go across the broad is very easy. Right now, in fact, um, for the past two days on the exhibition, we have a lot of interest on bringing this solution to Philippines, Vietnam, even down to China. So I would say that the universal platforms for this to happen um, across regional is possible. How do you compare yourself with competitors like, you know, Property Guru, this property, you know, SC Property? Well, as I end up um, on the last slide, the world doesn't need another property portals. But what we do see the difference here is that the social part, we're going to make a lot of difference. And our re um, revenue is not based on advertising. Our revenue is based on the usage of the applications, which is the apps. And how did you come up with that $300 price point? I mean, that seems a bit steep. You mean per customer? Yeah. Okay, right now, um, on average, an agent spend about, um, from starting point from about $100. There are some that go up to about $1,000. So from our first MVP, we are taking down that as an average. That's the reason why we come up with like a $300 per average, uh, average, paying, average pay per customers. That's $300. And also, and, and also, the, you know, all deals Asia, for example, was a deal aggregator for all the deal sites, right? Because you don't need another deal site, so therefore you would just go to the all deals Asia. Mm -hmm. And they offered all the filters, all the, but I mean, today, you know, people still go directly to deal sites, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's the Groupons and et cetera. I mean, yes. the, I know they don't need another property site, right? But yes. they're also branded the biggest top two property sites, let's say. Mm, what we see here is that, of course, Market, product market fit from the consumer market is necessary. But what we do see here is um, there's a moving trend into a, f a lot of frustration among even the buyers as well as the agents. So we do that, we do see that there's a potential for us to grow into that. Uh, do you ever face a rejection from the property side to let you actually post into their site? Because actually you're taking away their agent, right? You have the agent information. Right now what we are doing here is to allow the agents to work easily. Unless they are blocking the agents from hiring a personal assistant to do the posting for them on behalf. This, this is what we do. And it, if that's the case, then yeah, we shouldn't assist. But the agents, they love it. And uh, we also increase the number of listings to ST property or I property as well. No, I mean from the uh, property side. You mean like property? Property uh, guru, I property. Yeah, we do have some challenge uh, over in here. But we do uh, realize that um, the demand over like from ST and I property is pretty much uh, better than uh, the other one. Thank you, Nick, from Property. Thank so thanks. Good luck with that. Hi. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Joel. I run Haystack, and we give businesses economies of scale through a crowd pricing platform. Now, before I get into how it works, allow me to present the problem. This is Kelvin and Leon. They're designers, and they've got a great idea. They want to make the world's skinniest wallet. And because they're a small business, they can do it faster, better, and maybe even smarter. But like everyone else, they run into the same two problems when they try to bring the product to market. How many units should they make? And related to that, how do they price their products? Having a small market, they run the risk of underproduction. With high unit costs, you have higher prices, which then, low, uh, which then shrinks your potential market size. And you guessed it, this is a vicious cycle. And it goes on, and there could be potentially no more market. On the other hand, if they overproduce, they run the risk of having overstock and then having an overall loss on their project. Not a very good situation to be in. But we said, slow down a minute. What if we didn't have to make those decisions first? What if I could actually know how many units I was going to produce, factor in the economies of scale before I committed to production and pricing? What if I could actually take these decisions and put it in the hands of the purchasers themselves? So that's how we came up with the concept called crowd pricing. How it works is quite simple. The more people buy, the more everyone saves. Customers love it, and makers love it because that incentivizes their initial networks to spread it to their networks, bringing the price down. Even better still, what, what this system really does is it allows you to achieve maximum economies of scale before deciding on your production quantity and pricing. Now, to combat the late adopter syndrome, we've come up with a system called the Early Adopter Bonus. So the earlier you buy, the more you save as an individual. When anyone places a pre-order, they're basically uh, grabbing a spot on that green line. So back to the skinny wallet, 
It, this was an actual project that went live a month ago. Um, their, their minimum order goal was 50 units. They doubled that and hit their maximum of 100 units. They couldn't, get, they couldn't go beyond that because their factory, uh, that was their factory limit. And yeah, they basically sold out. We had to turn away orders. Now, they're a successful business, right? They're a real business. So they actually list the product on our marketplace alongside their other ready-to-make goods. What we've actually created here is an ecosystem that provides an alternative to retail, which is an industry that basically takes 50% markups on every stage of the distribution channel. So by giving everyone economies of scale, what you're going to see is a world with faster, better, and cheaper products. Everyone wins. And it's worked tremendously well. We raised $10,000 in our first month. Um, we, yeah, we just launched slightly more than a month ago. And our business model, we take a 5% commission on every successful project. So a conservative estimate of a 10% service market at an average project size of $5,000, uh, we're on track to hit $2.5 million in three years. Now that might not seem like much, but you, this, this is basically only the figures for the creative commodity industry. Um, in, crowd pricing could basically work on anything out there that has the concept of overheads and per unit costs. And one of our next uh, avenues is actually looking into large scale events. So how are we going to do this? We're going to growth hack the supply side. We're going to go to trade shows, do referrals and partnerships. And we're basically totally focused on bringing in more and more projects. The demand side is pretty much taken care of because the referral system is ingrained in the business model and has been working tremendously well. So where Haystack really stands is that we bring in the innovation and communality spirit that you see in Kickstarter projects and match it with the price competitiveness of Groupon. We think it makes a lot of sense because we're based here in Southeast Asia where people are price sensitive or, you know, in other words, kiasu. So we're first to market. Um, we're going to translate that to user base advantage and eventually uh, we're going to have stored value that will increase switch switching costs in the future. So who is Haystack? It's myself and my partner, Melvin. Um, I founded and developed the marketplace, working with over 100 makers in Asia, making sure that we had a product that they loved. And Melvin built the crowd pricing platform in the last three months. We're looking to raise 500K to help with marketing in Singapore, and eventually expanding to Thailand and dominating Southeast Asia. So thank you. You can find us just outside Booth 4 or on Techlist. What, what drove you to do this? Well, um, we actually, just to give everyone a bit of a backstory, we actually started out as a marketplace um, that served makers in Asia. What happened was that we saw a lot of people were quitting their normal jobs, our friends. Um, it was a phenomenon that was happening globally with the makers movement. And people were people are basically more ready to make stuff than ever before. So um, we started the marketplace. It, it was growing well, but it wasn't growing fast enough. Uh, we asked our audience what their problems were. This, the problems were pricing and production, so we came up with crowd pricing. So what was some of the initial customer development, like just walk us through, that got you to this model? You know what I mean? Like the, each of the businesses that you've tested this with, um, you know, how, what's the uptake? Right, well, uh, it was kind of a, a two-sided thing. So on one hand, customers weren't really buying because a lot of design products seemed to be really expensive. On the other hand, we went in and asked makers why, why were their products so expensive. So we actually realized that they were producing at a very small scale. Um, Singapore is a perfect example of that. We have a very small domestic market. So they, they, and sometimes design is a cultural good. So you can't export that. Um, and yeah, so on, on their end, they, they weren't purposely trying to price their products at a high point so that it's like, you know, designer or exclusive. Yeah, so we basically figured that, hey, we could actually solve this problem. As this is a platform and marketplace, you know, um, I can imagine, you know, all kinds of products uh, will come into your platform. Mm -hmm. So for a consumer and a user standpoint, how do you drive, you know, the, the, the consumer to come to your website? Because it's almost like a pasamalam, right? So, 
Okay, so the standard route for how a consumer should enter our site, right, is basically kind of like Kickstarter. What happens is that you realize that when you ever support stuff on Kickstarter, it's not because you go to their homepage and then you find a project you like. Rather, it's you see that you see a project, a cool thing being shared on Facebook. You go to that specific project and you order it. It's never through the platform's homepage itself. So similarly, um, the way we approach this is that we are the platform, we are backstage. The makers should be kind of the ones doing the initial seed trafficking so that their first few people come in. Of course, uh, we do make our site friendly enough so that there will be some cross-feeding here and there. For example, once I'm done supporting a project, I might go and check out what's on the rest of Haystack. Um, yeah. So with regards to quality, on our front page, we only publicize, we tend to publicize the more successful ones. Yeah. Uh, ju just to add on to that, um, basically, the, the referral system has worked so well in bringing new people in from social channels that 70% of the conversions are actually coming in from referrals. It, this kind of reminds me like of quirky.com, but it's kind of, except quirky is curated, right? And, and the whole kind of returns, I'm sure, is, you know, it's kind of handled uh, in terms of the quality, the, the QC. I mean, the challenges here is, you know, how, like, you know, if there's problems with the products, right? Like, who do they go talk to? Who do they complain to? Right? Because that backfire, I mean, when you don't control quality, I mean, that's going to be a challenge. We, we actually do screen every project that comes in. Um, however, we don't curate based on taste. We just make sure that the project's actually viable. Uh, it's not a scam, things like that. Uh, so we have a set of guidelines that, that helps us through that. Um, in, in terms of whether the product actually takes off or not, the nice thing is that the crowd's actually determine. Um, if, if there are problems, um, we, 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 do, you know, we do take the, the approach of you know, saying that we're not accountable in that sense. Um, we do direct them to, to the makers and we, we facilitate that, that communication process. I spent the past couple of minutes trying to figure out how do you make a business like this bigger? Because it's a transactional business. You know, you're selling products in the marketplace, you're getting your 5%. Um, but when people do their first run production, 100 units, 200 units, like you said, you know, because that's their first run. So what are your thoughts on, like, I know you guys mentioned that, oh, maybe we'll go into another category, like putting together events, did you say? Yep. Like events and trade shows, for example. Yep. But within this category itself, how do you make this bigger? Yeah, I think within this, uh, thanks for the question. It, within this category itself, what we're realizing is that, um, and maybe in response to your earlier question as well, um, our existing pool of makers were actually coming up with new products every season or every half year. Um, they, it's, it's something that retail does all the time. I think the market that we're actually functioning in here is actually the larger retail market as opposed to you know, um, maybe something that Kickstarter size. Something like m micro retail of sorts. Mm -hmm. But your projections still, like when you kind of math it out, like you, there's a lot of pain for two and a half million in three years. Like and you kind of know it as well. Yeah, I would, I would spend some time thinking how you can <laughs> just, Appreciate it. Yeah, just trying to make that bigger. Uh, there's a lot of potential here, you know, it's just making it bigger. Choosing a category would be good. Like fashion, for example. Right. Actually, yeah, that, that's, yeah, it's definitely something we're considering. Right now, we, we look at um, designers graduating from Thailand and Indonesia. There are 14,000 designers graduating each year. Um, they have facilities to, to produce stuff at, at a cheap price. Yeah, but thanks. Actually, fashion is, I mean, from a girl's standpoint, it's not good because, you know, you're talking about volume. I don't want to be wearing something that, you know, <laughs> every street, I, every turn of the corner, I see somebody wear the same dress as me, you know. So I'm not sure about fashion, though, but something else, you know. But I think choosing a category is the, one of the direction that you may want to consider. The other thing is that um, because in, people are going to buy, you know, it's a transactional, you know, uh, portal. And if you don't give any form of, you know, um, uh, so-called confidence, you know, in terms of the product quality, it's not going to cut it. Because customers, consumers have choices today. So, you know, why would they want to come to your site other than a cheaper in price? But again, the cheaper in price is only dependent if there is a crowd, you know. There is volume, right? If there's no volume, I'm going to pay, you know, probably about the same price, if not higher, you know, in other 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 uh, uh, site. So you want to consider about the quality aspect. How do you give that kind of assurance? Um, 
we do recognize your point. Uh, we think it makes perfect sense, like um, trying to basically improve site experience and improve the quality that we give to customers is always paramount, and we're always trying to improve that. I wouldn't say it's the best today. We can make it better. Um, now, one of the reasons why we think that this is our site gives an experience that's a lot better than traditional, like just go to the shop and buy something, right, is because from the start, we've always um, had this like, idea that when you go to Haystack to buy something, you're not just buying a thing, you're kind of buying a story or a journey. So you realize that throughout our site, right, we do things like whenever I an order, when I'm waiting for my order to come in two months, I don't just sit down and wait. Uh, what the maker does is that he publishes updates. He says, okay, I've just started production. Uh, this is a shot of factory. Um, I'm really excited to be doing this. Like, thanks for all your support. Um, here's shots of my products being made. And so the, what we actually give is that we let the consumer take part in this whole production process. Um, we want to make, we basically want to bring making closer to the customer. So I believe that's something that's very different from just buying from a normal shop where you never ever see the hands that make the product. Transactional entertainment. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you so much, gentlemen, Joel and Kelvin from Haystack. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. <laughs> well, um, as for scale, I, I, I'm not IT. I, I'm not crowd. I'm not data mining. We are in the space business. Um, before getting started, I have a question to you. We have the booth over there. There's a Saturn V rocket model there, but we are missing upper body. So if you find it, please let me know. That's a big problem for us. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, AstroScale, uh, we provide solution to clean up the space. Let me, let me show you what, what are surrounding us. All red dots are rocket bodies, all the satellites, fragments which came from collisions or explosions of you know, bodies and satellites. And they are called space debris, as you might know. And you might see some white dots that are operating satellites. Okay, so mostly red dots. These red dots are randomly flying around the Earth with eight kilometers per second, very fast. This is the most urgent problem to human beings. Three reasons. One, the pace of collision, especially in this red band, is getting higher and higher. American satellite, Russian satellite collided each other. Last year, Ecuador launched the first satellite, first satellite, but one month later, it was hit by debris and broken. So, so bad, right? And yeah, it's serious. And two, Actually, this will affect our daily lives. You use GPS. GPS comes from GPS satellite. You know, timestamp, stock market, internet are using all stamp, uh, timestamps, which also came from satellites. Farming, um, fishing, they use satellite data. Um, logistics, uh, ship, airplane, they all use the satellite communication. So what happens if they are you know, broken, right? Three. There's no clear solution yet, unfortunately. The government have had some efforts here, but they are so slow because of the political reason. So you have two options. Oops. Uh, I think this is an old one, uh, but anyway, I don't care. Okay, we have two. <laughs> okay, we have, ah, well, let me, let me, okay. Let me tell you one more, okay. All the space shuttles and ISS are over there, just between two lines. Green line is on the surface of the Earth. So we are trapped already. It's sad, right? So, okay. We have two options. One, do nothing, no actions, and your children will suffer more. Much, the children have to pay much more money. Or we collaborate now and make a difference and remove top 300 debris together, okay? You have to, you have to collaborate with AstroScale because number one, we are the first company in the world to tackle this problem. Number two, we have solution, technology, and business model, team, and speed. Let me briefly explain to you. This is my invention, BOY. The beauty of the BOY is very small but powerful. It sticks to the debris, and bring them down to the atmosphere and burn it. How does it work? 
all the debris are tumbling, uh, rotating, tumbling, okay? So we take advantage of that. It will go around and we will give the thrust when we can reduce the velocity of the debris maximum. And then we can change the shape of the, the orbit from circle to ellipse, then burn into the atmosphere. That's our solution. Okay, since launching it costs so much, so we pack six boys together into one mothership. This is the heart of the operation of us. Uh, by the way, the mothership is just this small, 1.5 meters. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Okay, okay business model. Um, sorry, ADR is active debris removal. We're going to start debris removal from 2020. Meanwhile, with this hardware and capability, we can provide what we call on-orbit maintenance service. Okay, on-orbit maintenance service. Maintenance service in, in space. That is inspection. We take pictures and the thermal data of the uh, target satellites. And the two, uh, the repair. Uh, even antenna is broken, we will relay the data by boy. And the third, tugboat. Okay, we can bring the, your satellite to the right position, increase the altitude or decrease the altitude, we change um, the orbit elements. Okay? So your question is how we can make money today, right? So this is the proof of how our technology and network is great. Uh, the most, okay, uh, sorry, okay, we, okay, Pokari Sweat is the most selling um, sports drink in Asian countries, especially Japan and Indonesia. Um, they would like to have a marketing promotion on the moon surface. They chose us to take care of, of all the technology side. Okay, we design, develop the payload, bring the lander and uh, launch service, and we provide a space uh, environment testing and whatever. We do everything. The launch will be October in 2015, next year. That's quite soon, right? Government cannot do this. Only us can do this. <laughs> this is our team. This is a moon team. Um, as you see, we are a multinational team. Okay? We are located in Singapore. Neutral image. We are, it's innate, innate DNA, yeah, Singapore. You know, so America, Japan, Europe, whatever. Um, we have one more debris team, which is consists of 21 people right now. These four universities, uh, two private companies agreed on my solution. So we're going to start that. Uh, this is old again. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Nobu. I'm Nobu, CEO. Um, I had IPO experience before. Um, I had a training at the NASA before. And... Yeah, so what I want to say is um, if, you, if you've not you know, uh, watched the movie of Gravity, please watch it, please. And if you are fed up with the IT companies, please join the space industry. It's time to change. Okay, space is not, okay, space is for startups. Okay, even startups can stand up. You know, you know what? Um, from the first year, we are profitable. That'd be great, right? Thank you. How much were you funded initially? Uh, it's 100% by myself. Uh, the initial capital is 200,000 US dollars. And you can create five boys with 200,000? Sorry? You created five boys with 200,000 no, 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 and a it, mothership? It, it, it's called more. So that's why I'm, I'd like to raise money now. <laughs> You're going to collaborate with me. So how many boys did you create? You have not created any boys yet. No, no, but uh, you know, the key elements like proprietary system, attitude control, whatever, are all there. That's important. Assembly is later. So there's a chance that boy might not work. That's right, that's right. So we have to test them a lot. Elon Musk burnt a lot of money with the failed rockets, right? So you're going to, how much are you raising? Like 100 million or what? Uh, no, 15 million. Yeah. What kind of uh, VCs do you think will invest in this? <laughs> Uh, that, that's my question to you. <laughs> I, I don't know that. <laughs> I, I don't know. Actually, I'm, I'm, I, I, oh, 
it's only 12 months since we started. So we just focus on the, you know, developing the collaboration and, you know, checking the key elements of the technology. So I think we could just start the raising money from now. You say you are based in Singapore now? Right, right. And where are you going to launch the rocket? <laughs> Um, I, I wish Singapore government will launch from uh, somewhere beside the Changi Airport. But, <laughs> well, um, honestly, the, the cheapest way is from Russia. Yeah, che cheapest way is Russia. But for the uh, moon landing, uh, we will launch from Florida. Uh, we bought a rocket from SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk. I mean, for your fundraising process, right, I'm just very curious. I mean, you must do research, right? Whether you're getting government grants, right? You're actually finding people in the industry. I mean, it's very interesting for me that you come to an event like this, um, whether it's for the press or, you know, why, why an event like this to raise funding when clearly this is more, I guess, targeted towards private kind of, you know, direct uh, capital or, 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 you know, well, um, VC specific. My, my short question is the reason why I'm here is not only the raising money. I'd like to increase awareness of this issue. Nobody knows about this. You know, you know space debris. But I, thank you. This is the most urgent issue in the world. Otherwise, you cannot you know, start, do startups. You cannot GPS, right? right? So. <laughs> I, I, well, you, 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 you have succeeded because you have raised our awareness about the debris issue. Yeah, well, you thanks know? to you. Yeah, well. Yes. Uh, I think, you know, but, you know, just to, uh, to provide some, you know, comment is that I think it will be better off if you have a corporate, you know, that supports you. Yep. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, and be the, probably the, you know, someone that, to showcase that, you know, it, this is, Something that a you know a particular industry or corporation would be you know uh, behind you to support you to see you through, uh, yeah. And then through with that, you know, I think VCs will mm -hmm. will be more interested in looking at you. At this juncture, I think you know it's pretty tough because yeah, mm -hmm. it requires a visionary to you know to to check along with you on this. Uh, thank you for that brilliant advice. Um, well, the only difference between IT and space is the time frame. Uh, we, we, we try to be as early as possible, but still, it's not three months, six months, you know. IT is sort of a 100 meter race, how fast you can run. But our business is sort of how you can run 100 meter by 15.00 second, something like that. So definitely we need some investors who can see us in the long term. So I, I understand you. So just lastly that, you know, in terms of the videos and or the, the presentation that you presented, to see some more damage, like real like carnage, that would be much better, I would say. Just in the opening. <laughs> okay. Maybe a shot from like gravity, something, you know, that is like, oh, hits you in the heart. Like because the, the diagrams, you know, it's not connecting emotionally. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll improve myself. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. No boo from Astro Scale, everybody.